Today's speaker is our own Ron Flannery, who's coming to speak to us again today. Um, Ron is a computer scientist, futurist, and a member of the board of directors of Red Bank Rubens. Uh, he's spoken to us many times on topics ranging from the psychology of art appreciation to genetics to artificial intelligence. Today, Ron will, talk, will walk us through the Drake Equation, which assesses what it takes for intelligent life to arise and how likely each factor is to happen a second time in our galaxy. He will then explore the possible reasons why we haven't yet encountered any signs of extraterrestrial intelligence. Then, following his talk, we can have a discussion where we can talk about how this search resembles and is different from the search for supernatural intelligence, and maybe how Donald Trump's meeting with Kim Jong-un resembles a first contact meeting as visualized in science fiction. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for coming, and please give a warm welcome to Ron Flander. So this is what I'm going to talk about, the Drake Equation and the Fermi Paradox. And this is a two-part talk. First part is, how likely is there intelligence any place? And the other part is, uh, if there is, if I can prove there is, then where are they? That's not happening. There were two guys, Giuseppe Cacconi and uh, Philip Morrison. They were physicists at Cornell, and they published a paper in the journal Nature called Searching for Extraterrestrial or Interstellar Communications. And they talked about how would you go about doing this? What are the ins and outs of looking for people out there or people like things out there? Uh, seven months after that, they did, uh, Frank Drake, who was an astronomer, started the first systematic search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, <coughs> he worked at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Green Bank, West Virginia. He called his search project Ozma, named after one of the witches in the Wizard of Oz. And they decided they were going to have a meeting uh, following in 1961. This is a picture of the radio telescope that they used for Project Ozma. Frank Drake is the guy uh, over here. Uh, and that's what it looks like in the control room. And uh, when he was told they were going to have this meeting and he agreed to do it, he said, well, let me put together uh, uh, some kind of argument about how probable extraterrestrial intelligence is in terms of those we could commu communicate with somewhere in our galaxy. As I planned the meeting, he said, I realized a few days ahead of time we needed an agenda, and so I wrote down all the things you needed to know to predict how hard it's going to be to detect extraterrestrial life. And what he came up with is the Drake Equation. And uh, it looks a lot more complicated than it is. It's really very simple. How many stars are there? And if you've got X many stars, how many of them are going to have planets? And if you've got that many planets, how many of them could support life? And if you've got that many planets with life, what's the likelihood that life will actually begin on those planets? And if that happens, what's the likelihood that you will get intelligent life out of that? And if that happens, 
what's the likelihood that you're going to get to a technological level where we could communicate via radio? And then because time is so vast in the galaxy, you have to also consider how long would they last? And how long will we last? And do we overlap? Because if we don't overlap, there's nobody to talk to. So that's the whole equation. And if you multiply all these things out, you get this number n, which is the number of intelligent species in the galaxy with whom we can communicate today. Uh, that's the whole thing spelled out. What I'm going to do is go through this uh, for each one of these items, and we'll do the calculation, and we'll come up with the answer. So the first piece is stars. How many stars are there? Now, originally when Frank Drake did this, uh, the Big Bang had not been established as the accepted <coughs> explanation for the existence of the universe at all. They believed in a solid state theory, uh, that the universe had always existed and it would always exist. So his calculation was uh, dependent on the, the rate that stars were born. So when he did the calculation in 61, uh, he just, you know, he had to guess at a lot of these things, most of these things in fact. And his guess was one star is formed per year. Now the, uh, the galaxy is 11 billion years old, and that would say that there are 11 billion stars, right? Uh, the number is much higher than that, so he was wrong. In, 20, in 2006, uh, they actually took the estimated number of stars and divided it by the age of the galaxy, and they came up with a number, another number. They said, well, early on it was somewhere between seven and 500 stars per year, and then it slowed down to five to 20 per year. Uh, and then in 2017, we're up to, it's somewhere between 1.5 and 3. Now I'm going to post these slides, so if you want to read all the details and my notes and everything, that will be available to you. But basically none of that matters, because now we know how many stars there are. We have a very good estimate, or at least you would think so, right? I, re I read dozens of articles in preparation for this talk, and I saw estimates anywhere from 100 to 700 billion stars in the galaxy, but most of them grouped around 200 to 400. But for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to be conservative and say there's 100 billion stars in the galaxy, and that's, that is a very conservative estimate. But that's the number we'll use. So this is what the galaxy looks like. There's this bar, uh, the galactic bar. And, uh, is Pat here? <laughs> yeah, you should change that to your login from now on, the galactic bar, that's you. Uh, and, and hanging off at the ends of this galactic bar, there are these spiral arms, and some of them are highly populated. There, you see there's a lot of stars in the Perseus arm, and there's a lot of stars in the Scutum Centaurus arm, and then there's this, this pretty weakly populated arm, the Sagittarius arm, and it, it kind of dwindles and peters out and splits into a, a continuous piece in this Orion spur. And that's where we are. This is like the North Dakota of the galaxy. Uh, we're really kind of out in the middle of nowhere. But if you look at our whole address here today, we're, we're in Red Bank, USA, our solar system, Orion spar, Sagittarius arm, Milky Way galaxy. I left out local cluster. That should be in there. And then the universe. And how do we know how many stars have planets? Uh, well, the way we used to try to figure this out was with ground-based observatories, but that's not very effective because you've got to look through the atmosphere and sometimes you have cloudy days and there's a lot of light pollution and it's just really tough. So then uh, we launched the Hubble Space Telescope and we started looking out into the distant past and far out into the galaxy using that. Then in 2003 we set up uh, the Spitzer Space Platform, that's an infrared telescope, 2009, the Kepler went up, and then in April of this year, uh, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite went up, and then in 2020, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to go up, and this will be the most t powerful telescope ever launched. Uh, so we'll get a lot more information from that. But uh, the Kepler was extremely uh, effective. So much of the data that's in this talk is based on Kepler. So how do you tell that there's a, a planet going around a star somewhere, you know, many light years away? Because stars look pretty small when you look at them, even with a telescope. How do you detect a planet? Well, one way is radial velocity. 
because objects that orbit around each other actually orbit around the center of mass of the two objects. So that means that not only does the planet go around, but so does the object it's orbiting. So if you've got a, a star here, it's going to orbit around the center of mass of these two objects, and it'll wobble as a result. And that wobble uh, appears in, um, in the observations that you see from uh, a telescope like Kepler. This is 51 Pegasi, uh, and you can see that there is a definite fluctuation in the way it moves. Yes. What's a Pegasi? Uh, that's just the name of the, uh, the planet that they discovered using this technique, 51 Pegasi. Pegasus. Pegasi? It's a Pegasus constellation. Okay. That's how they name it. Okay. Fifty first one in the yeah. Uh, so here's another way they do it. Uh, what this is is a picture of the sun with Jupiter transiting in, transiting in front of it. So if Jupiter transits in front of the sun and you're looking at it with uh, a telescope, what you'll see is the sun will dim by whatever percentage that is blocked by Jupiter, right? So you've got a certain amount of brightness, Jupiter comes into play, it dims, then Jupiter leaves and it gets brighter again. And the, the degree by which it gets dimmer is going to tell you how big that planet is. So that's the second way they find planets. Another way is uh, using absorption spectrum. Uh, and what happens here is they look at the light coming from a star and it has a certain spectrum that says hydrogen is being turned into helium. So you get a spectrum that indicates hydrogen and helium maybe some deuterium, maybe some other heavier things. Then a planet comes in front of it, and, you, and the atmosphere of that planet will absorb some of that light and indicate other elements, the elements that are in the atmosphere of that planet. So then you'll see hydrogen and oxygen, uh, maybe if there's water there. And then if you subtract the two, you can tell what's in the atmosphere of that planet. So we can, we can find a planet, we can see how big it is a lot of times, and we can tell what's in the atmosphere. Um, here's an example. This is WASP V12b. Uh, that's the name of the planet found by Spitzer. And in the atmosphere of that planet, there's methane, carbon monoxide, and water. So that's a planet, if it's in the right place, is capable of supporting some kind of life as we know it. Uh, pretty cool, found by Spitzer. Uh, finally, there's microlensing. The way microlensing works, this was predicted by Albert Einstein who was, as far as I know, always right. And he said that uh, a planet will distort space around it, the mass of the planet, and it'll bend light. Well, if it does that, then that bending of light acts just like a lens in the telescope. And that means you can use that, that massive object as a lens to see some other object that's far away. Pretty cool. So what happens if, if that... Uh, if that star that you're using as a lens doesn't have a planet, then you see this kind of image, which is uh, an enlarged image of the object that you're looking at. But if there's a planet involved, the planet will also diffract the light a little bit, and that will give you this secondary image. So if we see that secondary image, we know there's a planet there. And using this kind of technology, we've discovered confirmed as of December 2017, 3,567 exoplanets. Some are the, same, the size or near the size of Earth, okay, but that's not the, the majority. The majority are larger than Earth, and they get as large as Jupiter or bigger, uh, and Jupiter is 1,300 times uh, the volume of the Earth, so Jupiter is really, really big, but it's a gas giant. And the thing with gas giants is uh, life as we know it can't exist on them because, well, there's no surface to stand on. Um, I don't know what's down there when you get to the bottom of it. Nobody's ever sent a probe successfully uh, that deep into Jupiter. So we don't really know what's down there. But life as we know it probably can't exist. But many of these gas giants are going to have moons going around them that are just as big as planets. And I'll show an example of that later. So even though these are unlikely to support life themselves, the moons going around them could. 
And it was interesting to me when doing all of this that nobody is, seems to be doing that calculation. These are within the uh, Milky Way galaxy, I think. I'm sorry? These are all within the galaxy. All, yeah, all in this galaxy. Have exoplanets been discovered outside the Milky Way? Uh, I don't think so, because you know the distances are, are huge. Uh, if you look at how big the Milky Way is, and I'll, I'll show you a slide about that later on, we're looking at huge distances right here. Um, and to see what's going on in another galaxy is extremely difficult. But uh, let me go on with this. Um, another thing that we've noticed is single planet systems far outnumber multiple planet systems. So uh, when you look at the numbers we're talking about, there are, there are over 2,000 systems with only one planet that we can find. Now, there might be more than one there, but we can only find one. Um, and then as you go up in the number of planets in the system, the count of those systems keeps going down. And amazingly, a system with eight planets, we've only found two. And one of them is us. <laughs> um, I find this extremely unlikely, but this is what we've seen. So the fraction of stars that have planets, uh, as we've learned recently, now Drake said 20 to 50 percent of stars will have planets. But what we've actually seen is planets far outnumber stars. There are planets in our galaxy that have no stars at all. They're just floating free out there. Uh, and in fact, there's, a, there's believed to be a ninth planet in our solar system that's so far out, we can't even see it. Uh, but our current equation says the probability of a star having a planet is 100%. So if you've got stars, you've got planets. Now, if there's 100 billion stars in the galaxy, then there are at least 100 billion planets. So that's our number so far. Now, how many of those can support life? Uh, Drake, <coughs> guessing, said one to five. You know, and like, uh, I know where you got that number. Uh, but what does it take? Well, <coughs> as far as we know, you've got to have liquid water. And if you're going to have liquid water, you've got to be the right distance from your particular star. So that's called the habitable zone. And there's, there's an optimistic habitable zone. And then there's a conservative habitable zone, which fortunately, we're in it. I mean, good for us, right? And even Mars is in it. It's on the outside edge. But high probability that Mars then could support liquid water, and if it can support liquid water, then there could be life there. Venus, on the other hand, is way too close to the sun. It gets up to, you know, between four and 600 degrees on Venus. That's pretty hot, even on a winter's day. And uh, probably no liquid water on Venus, probably no life, at least as we know it. But look at all these other planets that we found that are in the habitable zone. Uh, and, you know, some of them are even in the conservative habitable zone. Uh, we even gave them names. These are all capable of having liquid water potentially supporting life. Now, how far are we looking, right? You said, can we see other galaxies? This is how far Kepler can see. 3,000 light years. How far is a light year? Uh, a light year is about 6 trillion miles. So that's, that's a long way. Wow. 3,000 light years is about 17 and a half million trillion miles. Yeah. But as you can see in the picture, that's a nit in the galaxy. But looking out that far, we found 2,525 confirmed exoplanets. 30 of them are Earth less than twice Earth size and in the habitable zone. So we found 30 planets looking out 3,000 light years could support life. Uh, this is pretty much a repeat of something we've seen before. So let's go past this. And I already talked about the business of rocky surfaces and gas giants. <coughs> Another thing you need for life is the, the chemistry that supports life. So uh, this is a, a picture of the Orion Nebula, and a, and a nebula is where stars are born. Okay, when a star goes nova, 
Well, let me back up. Uh, a, a brand new star is converting hydrogen into a heavier element, right? It's hydrogen to helium, and then, uh, and the way it does that is it fuses the hydrogen atoms together and it creates a helium atom and it throws off some energy in the process and that's where all the heat comes from. And so you're getting heavier and heavier elements being created in the fusion of the stars and eventually the star gets old, it's created all these heavy elements and it explodes into a nova and when it does that, it, it creates all of this matter that's floating around <coughs> in the nebula. And when you get enough stars explode, the nebula gets pretty dense and then the stuff starts to coagulate back together and when it does you get planets made out of those heavy elements that were produced. And another thing that you see get produced is things like sugar molecules and we've actually identified them in space in the Orion Nebula. So if we find a planet out there, it's in the habitable zone, it's got water on it, it's also got all of the elements necessary to support life forms. Sweet. Sweet, yeah. Uh, uh, here's a spectral analysis of the Orion Nebula, and you can see that uh, there's water there, uh, there's carbon monoxide there, there's formaldehyde there. Uh, so again, a lot of the chemistry necessary to support life exists, just floating out in free space. Want some uh, to support life? Yeah. <laughs> so right now, what happens with the planets when the star itself is already dying? Oh, they, they get blown away. Yeah. <coughs> so, there are planets which are kind of floating away from us. Oh, no, when I say they get blown away, they get blown away. <laughs> uh, but just so you don't worry, our, our sun is four and a half billion years old, and it's got another five billion to go before it blows up. So, we're, we're okay for now. Um, in 2013, uh, based on what they've learned from Kepler, and this is years ago, uh, they determined that there are as many as 40 billion Earth-sized planets orbiting in the habitable, habitable zones of sun-like stars. So 40 billion planets out there could support life. And 11 billion of those are Earth-sized. So our number uh, in our equation for the number of stars that have planets that can support life is 0.4. So when we do the math, uh, we come up with 0.4 and it's 40 billion. And just as a proof point, uh, take a look at our solar system. There's eight planets. Four of them are terrestrial, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Two are solidly in the Goldilocks zone, Earth and Mars, which means we're, we're not too close to the sun, we're not too far away, we can have liquid life. And one at least supports life. Just look around. Uh, <laughs> Felix will attest to it if he was, and he's not here. <coughs> but there may be more. Recently it was discovered that there, the, uh, there, the amount of methane in Mars' atmosphere changes seasonally. Uh, and I don't know if there are any cows on Earth, Mars, uh, but cows on Earth produce methane. And it would change seasonally if it was bacterial life producing this methane. So high probability that there's life on Mars right now. And there might be a couple of others. There's Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter, and Enceladus, which is a moon of Saturn. Here's Europa, Enceladus. <coughs> I'm sorry about this. Uh, they're covered with ice, but this one uh, is orbiting Jupiter, and you can see it's perfectly round, which indicates that it's big enough to be considered a planet. If Jupiter wasn't there, this would be a planet, right? And it's got oceans of water under the ice, and we know it's in liquid form, and the reason it's in liquid form is because of tidal forces from Jupiter, and also Jupiter radiates more energy than it takes in. So Jupiter is actually producing energy just like a star would, just not enough to be a star. So it's, it's like a, a really low-class kind of star. But very high likelihood that there's life on that moon, and that's one of the things that we're going to go look for very soon. Uh, and same thing with Enceladus going around Saturn. This is a, a microphotograph of a piece of a meteor that we believe was chipped off of Mars uh, millions of years ago, billions of years ago. And you can see there's a structure here that looks very much like uh, a microscopic organism. So if that is indeed a microscopic organism, uh, and it's kind of hard to determine because it's so old and so petrified, but 
if that's a microorganism that came from Mars, then potentially there was life on Mars then, there's life on Mars now, and uh, there's also the idea of panspermia, which means maybe we all evolved from this thing, uh, and we're all Martians. <coughs> so the fraction of planets that actually develop life, right now we believe it's about 0.4, 40%. Uh, if you look at the history of uh, our existence, Earth was, uh, came into existence about four and a half billion years ago. That's when the sun ignited and all the matter started coalescing uh, from the nebula that we were in. And about, and while that was happening, you know, the galaxy, um, or sorry, the solar system was very disorganized. So things were clumping up and things were flying around. And as the Earth was being formed, it was also being bombarded with bolides, meteors, comets. <coughs> and that went on for a billion years. So the Earth was a very inhospitable place for a billion years. And during that time, single cell life actually formed. So life, uh, if you believe that this happened, life is highly probable. If it's given a niche, it will come into existence, right? Because that's what happened here. But then it took another three billion years before we got to multicellular life. So how about civilized life? Well, 3.7 billion years ago, we got single cellular life. Then 600 million years ago, multicellular. 100 million years later, brains. Uh, 300 million years later, mammals. Mammals are the only animals with neocortex. Uh, and then 150 million years later, primates. And then us, after that. So what's the probability that intelligent life will develop? Uh, well, Stephen Pinker in his book, How the Mind Works, uh, he says for intelligence you need stereoscopic vision because you have to be able to see that there are objects in reality to be intelligent. You have to understand that there are objects. And those objects um, relate to the way you survive. Uh, society of some sort has to exist and you've got to have hands. But if you have all three of those things, then intelligence can evolve. So on our planet, that includes all of these animals, uh, and you notice that from here up, it's all apes. Here's an old world monkey. Uh, elephants recognize themselves in mirrors, as do dolphins and orcas, and even European magpies. Um, European magpies are, are descended from, as you know, dinosaurs, uh, and the number of neurons per cubic centimeter in the brain of a magpie is much denser than that of humans, which is why they are as intelligent as they are with such small brains. And then there are some other animals you could you could question. Uh, it's believed that dogs don't recognize themselves in mirrors because they're smell oriented rather than vision oriented, but uh, they do recognize each other. And I've played mirror games with my dog all his life. Uh, raccoons might be uh, capable of becoming intelligent. Octopi are really interesting. They have distributed brain structure, which no other animal has. Uh, so they're aliens from the get-go. What's that mean? Uh, distributed brains? Yeah. Well, your brain is in one place. It's in your head. But an, an octopus has parts of its brain all over its body. And they all operate simultaneously, so it's a massively parallel processing mm -hmm. engine. Uh, if you take away the hands, right, then elephants and dolphins and orcas will probably never develop the kind of intelligence we're looking at, like civilized life, because they just don't have the manipulators to do it. And dogs, you know, they can't open doors, so that, that holds them back. But even if humans didn't exist, there's still a bunch of candidates for animals that would evolve into civilized creatures. So currently the thinking is that if you have life, there is a 100% probability you're going to get intelligent life at some point. There will be some creature that evolves to dominate with its intelligence. 
so the next piece of the equation then is, well, how many of those are going to develop radio? And uh, Frank Drake <laughs> took a guess, 10 to 20 percent. That's a good guess. Uh, and then the final piece of the equation is, how long do they exist? Uh, well, originally they, they threw out a number. They said, uh, you know, if, if we get this far, we should live on as a civilization for 1,000 to 100 million years. Pretty optimistic. Drake said 10,000. Carl Sagan, when he was asked, he said a million, but that's only if we survive. And he was very cagey about it. Paul Horowitz, uh, uh, who was a contemporary of Sagan's, he, he was a little more pessimistic about it. He said a thousand years. But Michael Shermer, he looked at Earth civilizations and how long they've lasted. And, uh, you know, we've had a bunch of them. He looked at uh, 28, and he came up with an average of 420 years. But in my way of thinking, all of these numbers are totally wrong. And the reason they have to be wrong is because we are the first civilization that's had the ability to actually destroy the entire planet. So we're the first ones that have that kind of power. Uh, and that gives us a lot of reasons to be more careful, but it also, you know, gives us the ability to screw up royally. So if we work out the numbers now that we have them all, if you look at what they came up with in 1961, they said it was somewhere between 20 civilizations right now exist in our galaxy with whom we could talk over the radio to 10 million. Somewhere between 20 and 10 million. <clears throat> now, uh, we know it's somewhere between one, just us, and 300 million. And this is not an optimistic number. This is kind of a middle of the road number. Uh, well, 300 million, if this is true, that means that 0.3%, three stars out of a thousand, have an intelligent species living on a planet near that star right now who could listen to our radio signals or we could listen to theirs. There's another way to look at this, and this is called the pessimism line. And what the pessimism line is, is what is the, the probability that we are alone? What's the probability that we're the only civilized technological species in the galaxy? <clears throat> the Daily Mail did this exercise in 2016, and they said it's less than 1 in 10 billion trillion. The odds are less than 1 in 10 billion trillion that we're the only intelligent species in the galaxy. But they used the entire life of the galaxy. So what they're saying is, that's in 11 billion years, uh, and also they used all the most optimistic numbers. Uh, but if what I did was I, I adjusted their calculation. I said, well, the lifetime of a species is only 90 years. And why did I pick this number? Because that's how long we've been transmitting signals into space, 90 years. So if, if that's typical, that's how long a species lasts, is only 90 years or 100 years, uh, and as far as we know, that's, that's how long we last, right? Uh, then the number comes to be 1 in 990 trillion, and that's given the lifespan of this species. So just 90 years, the, still the odds are 1 in 990 trillion that we're the only ones here. If we take the equation with the numbers that we've been developing as I've been going along, and we leave this for the unsolved part of the equation, and we solve it for 1, then that says the odds of us being alone are 1 in 40 billion. Again, very unlikely that we're the only ones here. The odds of winning the power the Powerball are 1 in 292 million. So it's 137 times more likely that every time you buy a Powerball ticket, you're going to win the Powerball than it is that we're the only species in the galaxy. So the odds are good, we're not alone. Uh, Stephen Hawking said, the idea that we are alone in the universe seems to be completely implausible and arrogant, considering the number of planets and stars that we know exist, it's extremely unlikely that we are the only form of evolved life. So, as, as I told my wife the other day, Stephen Hawking agrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> so then we get to the Fermi paradox. What's the Fermi paradox? Well, Enrico Fermi, he worked uh, in Los Alamos on the Manhattan Project. He did the work that led to the invention of the nuclear reactor. 
the fission reactor. Uh, so, pretty smart guy. He was having lunch with a couple of his physicist friends one day, and they were talking about the probability that there's intelligent life in the galaxy, and they talked about it for a while. They decided, yeah, there must be, and he said, so where are they? And that's the Fermi paradox. Uh, but to break it down, he says, why are no aliens or their artifacts found here on Earth or in the solar system? Because of even the slow kind of interstellar travel that's possible. Uh, if, if that were the case, then it would only take from 5 to 50 million years for a species to colonize the entire galaxy. So they should be all over the place. If anybody came before us by 50 million years, they should, by now, have colonized the entire galaxy, and we should be seeing them everywhere. And yet we don't. Uh, another possibility is you have an intelligent species, not very much more advanced than we are, building self-replicating probes that go out, land on a small planet or an asteroid, build a duplicate of themselves, fuel up, go out some more, and keep doing that, replicating themselves by twos. Uh, and if they did that in as little as a million years, we should see these probes all over the place. And then the third possibility is you got a species that wants to populate other planets in the galaxy. So we send out two colonies to two other planets somewhere in the galaxy, and they send out each two more, and they grow geometrically. And after 38 generations of this, again, we've colonized the entire galaxy. If a generation took 263,000 years, the galaxy would be completely colonized in 10 million years. So where are they? And that's the Fermi paradox. So how would we see <coughs> signs of intelligent life outside of us in the galaxy? Well, there's a thing called the Kardashev scale, and we're on this scale as a 0.7. And what that means is we are not yet at a type 1, and in, in about 100 years, we ought to be a type 1, which means we are using 100% of the resources available to us on the planet. So all the geothermal energy, all of the solar energy that's coming in, all of the tidal energy, we're sucking it all up and we're using it. Uh, the next level would be a type 2, and they would use all the resources of a star. So how would you do that? Well, you create something called a Dyson sphere or a Dyson swarm. And what you do is you say, uh, for us, it would be we go out to the asteroid belt and we mine all the asteroids and we turn all that material that's out there into huge solar collectors and we put them in orbit uh, right there near the, the asteroid belt all the way around the sun and we start collecting all of the solar energy that's available in our solar system. And we suck it up, right? So an advanced enough civilization could be doing this. This was invented by another physicist, Freeman Dyson, so it's not, uh, it's not as sci-fi as you might think. Now astronomers predicted using computer models that the size of the star is going to affect how much light and heat it throws off. <coughs> and as the star size increases, it's going to throw off more light and heat, and as it decreases, it's going to throw off less. Uh, so size heat and light all go hand in hand. And uh, there's a probe called Gaia that uh, was launched by the European State Space Agency. And they've examined 100, uh, sorry, 1.7 billion stars. And this is the map that they created. And it looks just like the model. And based on this, then we could say, if there's a Dyson sphere out there, it would be bigger than your average star, but it would throw off a lot less heat and very little light because the Dyson sphere would be blocking it all and it would appear here. And you notice there's nothing there. There is one. And it's called Tabby's star. It's an F-type main sequence star. An F-type uh, means it's a little bit bigger than our sun. And main sequence means uh, it's converting hydrogen to helium. <clears throat> and it's in the constellation Cygnus. And it's about 450 parsecs from Earth. And it's 
brightening and dimming by 22%. That's a lot. And when that was discovered, people got real excited because they said 22%, somebody's building a Dyson sphere around that star. Uh, the scientists look at it and they said, well, it might be an uneven ring of dust, there's some fragments of comets, or small masses, but Jupiter is only 109th the size of our sun, and Jupiter is huge. So if somebody was building something that, or I mean, if there's some fragments of stuff out there in space that's blocking 22% of light, it's really, really big. The other, uh, the other option there is that the star is actually modulating somehow. In, in other words, it's getting brighter all by itself and getting dimmer all by itself, and we have no clue why that might be happening. Uh, here's an artist's rendering of this 22% of crap that's dimming uh, the Earth, or sorry, the, the boiling star, Voyaging star. Um, so, you know, good theory. But the real scientists are saying, the real scientists, well, we're skeptics and uh, we don't think it's, we don't think it's a Dyson sphere. So that's our best candidate and uh, there's no consensus at all. Uh, okay, so let's talk about time. Uh, the galaxy, as I said, should be colonized by now. So what's going on? Well, if you look at our history, there have been 11 major extinction events while we've been evolving. And some of them are pretty hefty. This one wiped out 99% of all life on Earth. So that's, we squeaked through that. Right. So the universe is 13.82 billion years old. The galaxy is 11 billion years old. We're our, our solar system four and a half billion years old. 600 million years to get from multicellular life to us. And during that time, there's been an extinction event on average every 55 million years. So every 55 million years, we could have been wiped out. Right. So it's very possible that there was one more extinction event or one less extinction event or they didn't happen when they did, we could, or, or some version of us, we earthlings, uh, could have come into existence 55 million years sooner or 55 million years later. Would that make a difference? Well, if you look at it as a timeline, I mean, here, here's the planet that's been in existence for four and a half billion years. And, and we're, you know, a sliver on the very end of that line. Um, there's a planet, Kepler-444, that came into existence 11.2 billion years ago. Maybe we just missed them, right? Maybe there was a whole civilization there. They came, they went. But another option is we're the first. And, you know, the other guys just haven't come along yet. Then there's the question of space. The galaxy is really, really big. Uh, it's almost 16 trillion light years in volume. So, you know, if you think about a bucket of stars, it's a really, really big bucket. And if there are 300 million civilizations out there and they're evenly distributed through the galaxy, then the nearest one to us would be 52,000 light years away. And that's a long, long way. So maybe they're out there and they're just not near us. We've been, uh, we've been transmitting radio signals for 90 years, and I don't know if you can see it from where you're sitting, but that blue dot would be how far radio traveled in 200 years. And if we blow it up, it's still a pretty small blue dot, <laughs> right? So the signal that we've been translating, I Love Lucy has not made it very far. Uh, and if you watch the movie Contact, you know, they're sending back videos of Hitler uh, the, uh, at the Olympics. You know, they'd have to be pretty close to us to have gotten that, that film. In fact, there are only 14,600 stars within this distance. But if, as, as we saw before, the optimistic number was 0 .003 of those stars have intelligent life on them, then we should still have seen 43 other civilizations. Yeah. The SETI project can only broadcast radio signals within less than one light year, right. which is way below where the nearest uh, uh, star might be. 
Right, and that's I even believe God. 14 ti times uh, less. Right, and, and you you read the slide earlier, right? <laughs> no, I went down with Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, SETI estimates that with radio telescopes as sensitive as the Arecibo Observatory, and that's the one that you saw in the movie Contact that's in Puerto Rico, that huge dish. Uh, that would only detect signals uh, at a distance of 0.3 light years, less than one-tenth the distance to the nearest star. and. It, that means it would take an antenna the size of the solar system to pick that signal up at 90 light years out. So maybe nobody knows we're here. Uh, there's a good possibility of that. The other thing is, up till now, we've only been listening at one frequency, 1420 megahertz. And uh, there's a good reason for that, and we can talk about it later. But that's, that's the frequency that Frank Drake picked. And he did get a signal. But when he listened to it, he said, well, it's too close. It's moving too fast. It can't be coming from another star. So what is it? And after doing a lot of research and, and talking to people he shouldn't have talked to, he found out it was the U-2 spy plane. <laughs> so now, thanks to computer science, uh, we can listen to a lot more channels. So then recently we started listening to over 70 million channels at once. Still haven't heard from anybody. So maybe the problem is nobody listens to the radio anymore. I mean, we don't uh, as a rule. I mean, if you're in the car, but even then, it's usually a satellite radio or digital radio. And, you know, uh, analog radio is really quickly going out of fashion. So maybe there are civilizations out there, but they don't do radio, they don't do TV, they do. Uh, you know, pulsations of encoded data hidden in pulsars throughout the galaxy. Could be. Well, whatever it is, uh, it's, it's not 10-10 winds. Another problem is, uh, or another reason that we might not be able to see anybody else is because of the great filter hypothesis. Maybe spontaneous chemical life just doesn't happen. Right? Maybe we were just really, really lucky that it happened here. But it did happen pretty early on, and it did happen in spite of tremendous difficulty. So maybe that's not it. Maybe it's the next gate we had to get through, complex animal life. Maybe that's the hard one that nobody else anywhere in the galaxy has managed to do, just us. Or maybe intelligent life. That's the hurdle that, that none of these other uh, potential beds of civilization could get through. Maybe it's civilization itself. Maybe that's the hard part. Maybe it's the technology. You know, maybe we're just lucky we've got fingers and stereoscopic vision. Or maybe the filter is ahead of us. So let's take a look at these things and see uh, what the problem is. And maybe, maybe it's not a problem at all. So there's the life issue. Are we the first, the only? Well, there is a hypothesis called the rare earth hypothesis that says, yeah, we're just really, really lucky because in order to exist as we are today, you have to have the evolution of biological complexity, which requires you got to be in the right place. And remember, we're out in the boondocks, right? If we were in the middle of the galaxy, stars would be exploding, we'd be hit with beta radiation, gamma rays, and we'd get fried before we got anywhere. So being out in the boondocks, that's kind of a prerequisite, and we're here. We're lucky. Uh, you also need a central star in a planetary system that is stable. And remember, when I showed you how many star systems have nine planets, or eight planets rather, there were only two. So again, we're really lucky. You gotta be in the habitable zone. And we are. We're really lucky. Uh, you gotta be on the right size planet. If it's too big, gravity's gonna be too intense you're not going to be able to do anything because you'll be stuck to the ground all the time. You'd just be a bunch of flatworms here. Uh, or if it's too small, then it won't hold on to the atmosphere, and that's the problem with Mars, maybe. Uh, you need a, a giant guardian planet like Jupiter because that's going to sweep up all the meteorites and bolides and comets that would otherwise hit Earth and give us another extinction event or two and make it impossible to be here. So again, we're just really, really lucky. You need a large natural satellite to give you tides 
and a magnetosphere and plate tectonics and all the things that we've been really lucky to enjoy. You need the right chemistry in the atmosphere, the, the lithosphere, the ground, uh, and the oceans. And you need the evolutionary pumps like glaciation and the rarity of bolide impacts. We were just really, really lucky there. And then whatever led to the invention of the eukaryote cell, sexual reproduction, and the Cambrian explosion, we're just really lucky. And nobody else is this lucky. So that's a possibility. Then there's the whole business of extinction events uh, that might have prevented us from coming into play. And I'm only going to focus on five here, um, just to be quick. The first one, 439 million years ago, wiped out 86% of life on the planet. And there's a trend that I want you to note. This was global climate change that wiped out 86% of the life on the planet. Next one comes along. 364 million years ago, wipes out 75% of life on the planet. Ocean chemistry changed, changed the global climate. The Permian-Triassic extinction wiped out 96 to 99% of life on the planet. Ocean chemistry changed, global climate change. Uh, 200 million years ago, asteroid impact wiped out all the dinosaurs, or most of them. 65 million years ago, this is the one with big rock came down and hit the Yucatan Peninsula area, wiped out all the dinosaurs again, uh, global climate change. So yeah, global climate change looks like, that's, that's bad news. And, and ocean chemistry change also looks like it's bad news. Uh, I read recently that in the year 2020, the amount of plastic in the oceans will outweigh the fish. So you got all these extinction events, and maybe uh, maybe these extinction events are, are what's preventing other civilizations from coming into being. And then there's the longevity issue, right? In all of these equations, the big number, the big difference between all of these probabilities is how long does the civilization live? How long does it last? So maybe that's the problem. Uh, and the great filter hypothesis. Uh, saying that we have to get through a bunch of gates, maybe the last gate is the one we're not going to get through. And this is the depressing part. Because um, we could blow ourselves up, uh, we could contaminate the environment to the point where we can't support ourselves, we could deplete our resources, climate change could get us, epidemics, asteroid strikes, technology could get out of control, nanotech, biological warfare, artificial intelligence, we could be in a world of hurt, you know, in the next 50 years. Uh, in fact, Stephen Hawking, our old friend, said in 2016 that we have about 100 years to get off the planet or the whole species is probably going to be dead. Oh. <laughs> and you've heard of the doomsday clock. Uh, this is the uh, bulletin of the atomic scientists. They put this out every year. Right now it says we're two minutes to midnight. Uh, they have an eight-page statement and the reasons they list is nuclear threats, mm -hmm. uh, climate change in action, disruption of democracies, breakdown of international order, and uh, you can't help but think of some name leaping to mind. <laughs> uh, and then again, maybe there's no paradox at all. Maybe we see space aliens every day. That's possible too. There are thousands of UFO sightings per year, uh, and, and I know this is meaningless because this is how many people support Trump, but a third <laughs> to a half of the population believes UFO, UFOs are spacecraft, uh, 6 to 13 percent of all of the government investigated UFO sightings are not explained, uh, which is a lot because, you know, it, it's hundreds. And uh, up until just recently, they were still spending money investigating this stuff. They called it the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program, and it gave us this guy. Uh, now, I, I have two apologies to make uh, before I run this video. Uh, the first is, while you watch this guy, try not to think of Beaker from, um, no, from the Muppet Show. And also, um, this came from Fox News and Tucker Carlson. Oh, wow. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. UFOs have been the stuff of conspiracy theorists for decades, often mocked for talking about it, but maybe they shouldn't be mocked. 
Commander David Fravor spent 18 years as a naval aviator pilot. In 2004, he had an unforgettable encounter with an aircraft he said was defying the laws of physics. Former Commander Fravor joins us tonight. Thanks all for coming on tonight. Um, t tell us, tell us what you saw. Well, we were on a we had launched on a routine training mission. Uh, when we joined up, we were told that the event was going to be canceled, and that we had real world tasking, and we were sent out to the west. Now, take in mind that this has taken place about 100 miles southwest of San Diego, between San Diego and Ensenada, Mexico, yep. uh, on a clear, perfect day, blue waters. We get out to the spot where they tell us it's at. Um, we start looking around, and both of us, both airplanes, see a disturbance in the water and a white, 40-foot-long, tic-tac-shaped object just hovering above the water, going forward, back, left, right. There's no rotor wash. There's no wings, nothing. So as we drive around in a clockwise flow, we get to about the 9 o'clock position, and I said, well, I'm going to go down and check it out, and the other jet is going to stay high. So as we go down, and when we get to the 12 o'clock position, it starts to mirror us. So it's in a clockwise flow, and it's on the opposite side of the circle from us. And we continue this. It's in a climb. We're in a descent. We're getting a great look at it. This whole thing takes about probably up to five minutes from the time we show up. I get over to the 8 o'clock position. It's at about the 2 o'clock position. And I decide I'm going to go and see what it is, and it's about 2,000 feet below me. And I cut across the circle, and as I get within about a half mile of it, it rapidly accelerates to the south in about two seconds and disappears. What, what would you estimate the speed? Uh, well above supersonic. It, it like a bullet out of a gun, it took off. So from what you know about aerodynamics, mechanics, <laughs> physics, uh, should this be possible, what you saw? Not with the technology that we have today. Not, not at all. Even now, even 13 years later, is there anything that you know of capable of this kind of behavior? No, there's nothing I know of. I mean, this when you look when we saw the, the video with the IR, it has no exhaust, uh, it, you know, no no discernible things of anything form of propulsion, and this thing came from a dead hover over the water, just kind of moving around to a climb up to about 12,000 feet to rapidly accelerating away in a climb, and in less than two seconds it was gone. And you figure you're talking. 50 miles of visibility, and you can easily see an object that size easily out to 10 miles, and it just disappeared in seconds. Could, I mean, what would be the effects on a human pilot of the G-forces involved in that altitude change? Uh, well, the altitude would be bad. It would be the acceleration of the altitude. That's right. right. Um, the, well, I, honestly, I wanted to fly it. <laughs> yeah, but, I uh, uh, You know, there's, you know, talking to some physicists, they don't think the human body could handle that kind of force with that yeah, it acceleration. Yeah, doesn't, it doesn't sound, it doesn't sound like the human body could. So bottom line, what do you think this was? I believe, as do the other folks that were on the flight, that we, when we visually saw it, that it was something not from this world. When, presumably you expressed that belief to your superiors, what did they say? Well, actually, we, we caught a lot of grief getting back to the boat. Uh, and it got passed off as an event that no one could explain. Now keep in mind, they had been tracking these for two weeks prior to us seeing it, and this was the first time that manned airplanes had been airborne uh, when the objects appeared. This feels like a really big story to me. I, I'm not, it's not exactly clear why Vladimir Putin is more interesting than this. I think this seems like a big deal. Commander, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about it. You seem sober and believable. And I appreciate it. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Doctor. Thanks. <laughs> okay, well, if that proves nothing else. Uh, it proves Tucker Carlson is a jerk. <laughs> and a mouth for you. So, let's, let's say that's true. Uh, there are aliens here. Why aren't they talking to us? That's the other uh, big question. So, I have a bunch of sci-fi scenarios I'm going to run by you uh, about why they're not talking to us. There's the prime directive, right? If you're a, a Trekkie like me, you know that you're not supposed to interfere. We're only interesting as an anthropological study. They're here, you know, taking water samples and stuff like that. And uh, they can't expose us to foreign ideas, beliefs, or technologies because something like this might happen. This is the cargo sec from the island Vanuatu. In World War II, crates of supplies that from destroyed warships floated up on the island. And for the first time in these people's lives, they saw airplanes going overhead. And they believed that the airplanes were gods delivering them 
stuff. So they started building things that looked like airplanes to get the gods to come back and give them more stuff, and they formed a whole cult around it. <laughs> there are, <coughs> in the United States and other places in the world, cults based on UFOs. So uh, we're pretty primitive still. Then there's the vulture scenario. They're just waiting to see if we self-destruct or grow up. And if we self-destruct, they're going to come down, clean up the mess we made, and take everything. Uh, and if we grow up, they'll just make us an offer we can't refuse. There's the Organian scenario. This is one of my favorite Star Trek episodes. It was aired in 1967. And uh, basically what happened is uh, the Enterprise showed up on a planet along with the Klingons, and there were dilithium crystal three mines there. And of course, we wanted to negotiate. The Federation wanted to negotiate with the Organians to get their crystals, and the Klingons just wanted to kill everybody and take them. Uh, so there was this big argument, but uh, the dialogue, just uh, highly modified, said, uh, the Organians speaking, we find interference in other people's affairs most disgusting, but you gentlemen have given us no choice. Your emotions are most discordant. We do not wish to seem inhospitable, but gentlemen, you must leave. The mere presence of beings like yourselves is intensely painful to us. Uh, and then it turns out that, uh, you know, they're a million years old uh, civilization, and they turn into big balls of light and dis disappear. <clears throat> so maybe that's it. We're just disgusting. <laughs> then there's uh, the mediocrity principle. Uh, this was from Carl Sagan. He said, you know, we, we live in an insignificant planet of a humdrum star lost in the galaxy, tucked away in some forgotten corner of the universe. Don't forget we're in North Dakota here. Uh, in which there are far more galaxies than people. So we're just not interesting, you know? Uh, and, and the galaxy is urbanized and we're a bunch of hicks. They don't care. Then there's the other possibility that there's a... There's no travel or, or anything like that actually going on. Maybe what's happened is in the galaxy all these civilizations have invented the galactic virtual reality internet of sorts. They don't have a need to travel and then the question is, well, how do we sign up? How do we get on this, uh, this thing? What's the medium? What's the frequency? What's the encoding? Uh, where do you even point the antenna? And again, we're, we're just takes. There's the zoo hypothesis. Uh, this is just a quaint nature park, and uh, if you carry it in, you have to carry it out, and you're not allowed to pick the wildflowers, and so we see them go by. And then finally, there's the question, do we even want to be visited by space aliens? And, and that's, a, that's a valid question, and we've done some pretty amazing things. Uh, in 1974, we transmitted information about our very DNA structure to a specific globular cluster, M13, uh, in an attempt to communicate with people on another planet. It might be a good idea, it might be a bad idea. In 77, Voyager 1 had a, a gold record on it. Here's a picture of it. Uh, this is the message from Arecibo. This is a map of where we are in the galaxy. And these are pulsars, and if you count the blips on the line, you know how fast that pulsar is, is flashing, and you know our relative position to all these pulsars. And it, it's like, we're here. Guys, whoever finds this right, we're here. Uh, again, good idea, bad idea. Hawking thought it was a bad idea. He says meeting an advanced civilization could be like Native Americans encountering Columbus. That didn't turn out so well for the Native Americans. Uh, and, and finally, we haven't actually been looking very hard. Up until now, we've only spent two, five, two and a half million dollars a year on SETI. And it's only last year, uh, Stephen Hawking, working with a Russian billionaire and Mark Zuckerberg, uh, decided to put $133 million towards this search. So, uh, that's everything I've got. Thank you. I had a document. Uh, oh, oh, here. Um, there, there was a news station that picked up on that story that the, the jet pilot was telling, mm -hmm. and uh, they went around and tried to find documentation, and they posted it on the internet. I got a copy of it. So, if you want to look at what is purported to be the Navy's report on that sighting, here it is. Uh, Pretty interesting stuff, if it's for real. 
I, I asked my military expert over here if it seems legit, and he says, eh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, well, uh, in your talk, you already anticipated a number of questions that I, that I thought of, but I imagine that with 45, 60, 50 people in the room, probably have a question that you yeah. haven't thought of. Yeah. What? Uh, oh, lots of hands already. All right. The Fermi paradox is sometimes referred to as the Fermi heart paradox. Heart is the uh, scientist from the Advanced uh, uh, Center for uh, Atmospheric Research who took the uh, devil's advocate position and uh, wrote extensively about the reasons why we can find anybody out there. Yeah, did I miss any? Uh, not really. You've been pretty comprehensive. But he organizes all the cate categories that you refer to into four uh, explanations. One is physical, the difficulties of uh, traveling through space and time. Uh, the second one is uh, sociological. Maybe they just are contemplative civilizations. They don't care to travel through space. Right. Or maybe they fall back on their entertainment industry, like a VR, a virtual reality world. They don't care about the real reality. And many other explanations. Sure. The, the third one is the temporal. We are not uh, coinciding with their uh, period of uh, advanced uh, technology. Right. Or maybe they self-destructed themselves, or we can self-destruct ourselves before we get a chance to encounter them. Right. And the fourth one is that maybe they've been here already, maybe before us. our time. Yeah. And if that's the case, maybe the UFO people may have some point to uh, demonstrate. But so far, uh, still nothing. Yeah, we've got nothing solid. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, that video with the jet pilot is, that's pretty good stuff. Uh, I've watched. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say this, but in doing this research, I watch a lot of UFO videos on YouTube, and most of them are a total bunk, uh, obviously so. But this one looks pretty good. And, um, and the report, if you look at it, there's some really solid stuff in here. Uh, a lot more than he talked about. Do you have a copy of it? Um, well, I've got this copy if you want to look at it. You're welcome to the Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the uh, methane on Mars. Just this week, though, there was an article about finding organic matter yeah. on Mars. Uh, you didn't specifically mention that. Can you get a comment on that, please? Well, uh, the, the big thing that they found was the, the variation in the methane level. Uh, the fact that there's organic material there necessary for life, you know, that's, we've known that for a while. We just haven't been able to find any real life. But one evidence of life is the generation of methane. Uh, you know, bacteria have gas. Uh, and the fact that it's periodic, along with the seasons, indicates that bacteria might be growing in large quantities and then dying back and then growing in large quantities again, right? So that's a pretty good sign. Uh, we still don't have hard evidence, but that's, that's pretty good. I had a question. First of all, I enjoyed it. Please thank you very much. Um, is another possibility uh, we haven't seen intelligent life is that they've already gone through the technological singularity that, that we're 20 or 30 years away from and they're so vastly more intelligent than us that we wouldn't even be aware of them? Well, you know, that's a real good question, but uh, if... I don't, I don't want to get too deep into the whole singularity thing, but it's if there is a singularity and it wipes us out, it would have to have some kind of motivation and that motivation, you know, it, given the, the big numbers we're talking about, at least some civilization would have sent out robots that are doing exploration, right? Uh, no matter what their motivation is, that's very likely. So, you know, why, why aren't we seeing these robots all over the place? And then again, maybe we are, and we just don't know where we're looking at. Wonderful. Thanks. Talk. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you very much. You took us through a number of uh, factors. factors that I'm trying to think of the word. Um, 
that would keep us from happening. And I'd like to uh, bring up another one. Oh. And that is um, the change from um, single cells to multi cells really was very important, very big in our development. And the reason this happened is because the atmosphere had at some point enough oxygen to allow multicellular organisms to exist. Yeah. And the reason that this happened, this oxygen in the atmosphere, was because some cell about 300 million years ago uh, developed chlorophyll. Yeah. And this reaction was beneficial to that cell. So it produced many other cells that produced an awful lot of oxygen. And at some point, there was enough for multicellular organisms. Yeah, and it, but, and it created global climate change in the process and wiped out a large percentage of the life on the planet. That's true, yeah. but we still had oxygen yeah. to develop more multicellular organisms. Yeah, we're really lucky to be here. Right. We are so improbable. But the point I want to make is... I would like to say, though, that, that of all the improbable people in the world, you are one of the most improbable. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> okay, so the point I'm making, though, is the development of chlorophyll, as far as we know, only happened once. Just once. So if this chlorophyll hadn't been produced, one wonders where this planet and we would be yeah. now. And it took three billion years for that to happen. Yes. Yeah. It was a real contingency. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Just to, to add on to that, probably most of us remember hearing in our first biology class the, 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 a discussion on the topic of so-called spontaneous generation. There was a time three, four hundred years ago where many scientists believed that spontaneous life uh, occurring happened all the time, but that's how meat spoiled. That, that oh, yeah. you know, that you could just start with something dead and life would just spring up inside it and rot it and and then that was disproven and we discovered that spontaneous generation is actually very difficult and we now know that all life is related. So it's not like there are competing initial generations that have been you know, each have artifacts in our in the DNA of living organisms. It's just like once. So that may speak to how rare that is. It also may be that it may also be that once you have one form of life, it's very difficult to for another one to to be successful in in competing, and so it you know, tamps down. But still, it's an interesting interesting to think about that 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 rarity. You had a slide up there. It looked like a list of prerequisites for a planet to sustain life and intelligent life. And I thought curiously absent from that list was the fact that we have a magnetic core and that magnetism, of course, that produces the aurora borealis, it protects us from the ultraviolet rays of the sun. Mm -hmm. So without a magnetic core, how can a uh, a planet like Mars to possibly sustain life. You know, the, the life would be just blown away by ultraviolet radiation. And I don't know, maybe I missed it on that list. I don't um, know. Uh, I didn't make this list. This is something that... Uh, I got to believe, though, that that's all. very important. Well, uh, it says uh, a large national satellite conditions needed to ensure the planet has a magnetosphere. Okay, maybe, maybe that's it then. Yeah. That's okay. But yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, life is improbable. And not all of these things are independent. So if you have a planet our size, then it may be very likely that all the all the metals fall to the core through gravity and they get that. Um, but then. I don't have a question, uh, just a, a comment about a resource. Uh -huh. There's a great radio lab episode called Cellmates about how uh, we went from single-celled organisms to 
multicellular life on Earth. Uh, that's worth a listen. That's not radio lab cell mates. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Mrs. Flannery, thank you. Um, you did an excellent job. I just wanted to throw out an idea, kind of an aha moment for me. When you, when you mentioned uh, Fermi and you mentioned Drake and Einstein, these are all names that are associated with atomic theory and basically the development of a massive war engine, as well as breakthroughs in physics. So I think it's interesting to consider the fact that most of our technology in the last half a century or century have come from uh, kind of a war engine. And we mentioned, somebody mentioned the singularity, um, technological achievements, the possibility that we, be, we may become cybernetically enhanced in the near future. Um, the possibility that robots are already exploring the entire universe and self-replicating. And so it's interesting to think that um, that aggression and that sort of um, war against nature is somewhat necessary for our continued growth and expansion. Yeah. It's an interesting thought. It's a tough spot to be in, right? It's, right. It's, we want to be peaceful, but uh, we are at war with nature. Well, yeah, and There's evolution. a possibility we may be at war with other species when, if and when we do find them. One of the side effects of evolution is uh, all the animal stuff that comes along with the brain. And the animal stuff is what drives most of what we do. You know, hormones. Question, Ron. Yeah. Do we have brains here now? <laughs> no, 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 no. Bear with me. Like Fermi. Like Sadie. Like Einstein. Okay. Like who will bring us through to further knowledge or the capabilities of fending off biological war, nuclear warfare. Are we in the process now of extinct, extinction, um, climate change, possibilities of nuclear war? I mean, I, I question these all the time. Well, uh, the problem with, uh, this is not my place to even say, but you know, as long as, as, long as uh, the people that run the world are driven by money, uh, and money doesn't necessarily come from following science, then we are constantly going to put ourselves in a position where money is more important than reality. And, you know, that's where we're at. That's where we're true. at. That's so, true. you know, either, either we fix this or uh, we won't survive it. Okay, so how do we well, you know, who'd you vote for? Did you vote for Hillary? Did you vote for Bernie? Did you vote for Donald? None of them. So you're part of the problem. <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. I'm going to go... Go back there. Okay. Um, the second term is after I've the first time. Is there a solar shield? Is that the magnetosphere? Same as magnetosphere? There is a solar shield, I think, that protects us from the same thing. Uh, yeah, it's part. Yeah. yeah. Back to uh, Kontrashev. I believe it's the Russian who uh, uh, could divided civilizations in three types, three categories. Uh -huh. And he also pointed out that the hardest thing for any intelligent uh, being is to survive from type zero, where we are at, to type one. Mm -hmm. If they make that uh, jump into type one, uh, chances are that they will live practically forever because the technology would evolve and advance and they'll be able to uh, forestall any possible dangers uh, coming to them from the universe. So but uh, the hardest thing is to jump from type zero to type one, because we are at the pre-civilized stage, where killing each other is much more important than advancing the civilization by and large uh, across the planet. And uh, if we can make the jump into type one, where we'll be able to harness all the energy coming from the sun, mm -hmm. then uh, the sky literally will be open. Uh, but I'm still skeptical about the possibility of uh, uh, getting in contact with other civilizations. I think that's the 
uh, the default is that we will never be able to do that for all the reasons that Hart enumerated. And uh, the chance that we be in contact with another alien somewhere are so astronomically, literally, uh, minimal because all the calculations that you presented in the first half of your presentations are all conjectural. Yeah. And none of them is based on actual experience, scientific uh, experimental science. It's all just pure uh, specu speculations. And uh, the astronomer Guth actually came up with an even more fantastic uh, explanation. He said maybe all the advanced civilizations have already moved into the multiverse, into alternative universes. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why we don't see them. We can get in touch with them. Uh, I like this universe. <laughs> I'm staying here. Grass is always green. Yeah. So, yeah. so we've, we've touched a little bit on, on the merit, on the merits of reaching out to extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, you, you were saying with the, you know, sending that record out there with its, with the coordinates of here we are, is that a good idea or a bad idea? I, I think that, that's another interesting thing to, to, to think about is, do we really want to be discovered? Yeah. Um, I'm not convinced we do. And I often think, uh, as, 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 a, as a secular humanist, I often compare the notion of, of, of an, an alien civilization contacting us with, with, with our interest in, in finding the divine. And both seem like it's sort of a, you know, some impressive superintelligence reducing my, my freedom of action, my self-agency, um, my possibility. I don't really, I don't even wish for, you know, the, the goods that might come from experiencing advanced technology because I am unhappy with the, with the prospect of being sort of ruled by or controlled by this uh, this extraterrestrial intelligence or or, or 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 divine being, and we might not be able to tell the difference. <laughs> uh, if, if you look at the history of what's going on on our planet, though, I mean the, the natives in South America, uh, the natives that were here, the Aboriginals in Australia, every time an advanced civilization comes on a less advanced civilization, it's not good for the natives. Right, so it's always bad for the natives. Either their habitat is destroyed, or they're killed off by disease, or they're economically disadvantaged, or, you know, right. nothing ever good ever comes out of it for them. So. Just a silly thing. I think we can go galactic before... Galactic bar, speaking. Before, yes, galactic bar. I'd rather be galactic bar than uh, Roseanne bar. <laughs> 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 but I think we can go before chlorophyll and go to uh, matter and antimatter, and the fact that matter won, so that's why we're here. Yeah. Go matter. It's here for matter. There were so many things you said today, were just wonderful. <clears throat> Thank you for that. But I was particularly impressed when you started talking about luck. Aren't we lucky that? Aren't we lucky that? Do you think it's just luck? Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm always thinking about the universe and the mysteries of the universe. Is there something else there that's controlling us? I don't know. Mathematics. Mathematics? Physics, yeah, chemistry, all that stuff. So it's just left there. Well, uh, it's an interesting thing. You know, have you ever heard of the anthropic principle? No. Uh, there's two, two concepts, the, the strong and the weak anthropic principle. The weak anthropic principle says, the universe is structured the way it is because we're here. And so when we look out and we say, wow, look at how lucky we are that the universe is constructed the way it is, that's only true because if it wasn't constructed that way, we wouldn't be here to say it, right? That's the weak anthropic principle. The strong anthropic principle says the universe is the way it is so we can be here, right? Uh, but that, that implies... Uh, you know, somebody making a plan somewhere, and that's that's where I draw the line. I, I go with the weekend profit principle. The whole, whole question of the universe, 13 billion years old, what was before? 
you know? Are there multiple universes out there? Was there a Big Bang that we're all over? So it's, it's just so mysterious that I can't yeah, get my mind around it. it's mysterious. But the Big Bang Theory is pretty solid. Oh, that, um, yes. There's yes. lots of evidence for it. Yes. So, yeah. But, you know, you either go with it or you reject it. And, and you know, there are people that believe the Earth is flat still today. Still today? Yeah. yeah. The, the, the trend is going in the right direction in terms of our understanding of these things. And our understanding is so much more powerful and reasonable and uh, based on evidence than we had 100 years ago, 300 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Imagine what's going to be like so, the next 100 years. And, and even with the Drake equation, when Francis Drake was Frank. drowning this Frank. Frank. When Frank Drake was, was putting this together on, on, his, on his back of the envelope, he, he had a lot of uncertainty in all those factors. Yeah. And we've got half of them pretty well understood yeah. to the point where we're like, oh, that's not really much of a barrier. I don't know whether, I think we, I think we probably get the easier one, but it may not be that easy to get to the rest, but um, one more thing when they go, right? Maybe we should just accept that you're here. I got your choice. This is a quote that I like from Neil deGrasse Tyson. God is an ever-receding pocket of scientific ignorance that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller as time moves on. In other words, we're still discovering. We don't know, you know, what happened before the Big Bang or the multiverse. Yeah, and divine intervention is becoming less and less necessary. Yeah, he says it. Um, thank you for your presentation because I was kind of skeptical in coming. I said, well, no, you know. But this is, was wonderful because it, it helped me to understand the scale of things, you know. Um, and yeah, the really galaxy is huge. Especially, well, he compared to our knowledge, and when you showed the picture where, you know, because we hear about it, well, we have a telescope, we can see everything now, right? So we can only see, you know, uh, well, I guess the images, whatever they are, can come just from a certain limited, very limited distance. So that, that was very nice. Um, this project, Rockwell, what, what was the name? 1951, supposedly they were doing some kind of, uh, yeah, like the, the UFO pro uh, project oh, yeah. or something like that. What is, does that need reality to this? Uh, yeah, the, back in the government or? until very recently had a project going. Uh, it was looking at unexplained aerial phenomena. They they put twenty two million dollars in it. Uh, you know, and they didn't have a large staff, but they did gather up all the reports they could get. Um, my sister's father-in-law was a, an airline pilot, and uh, he said that, you know, pilots see this stuff all the time. They see UFOs all the time, and they don't even bother to report it anymore because it gets no, no traction. Uh, and in fact, this guy that, that you saw on the TV clip, uh, when he, he and his buddy landed on the aircraft carrier, uh, they were greeted by their their compatriots all wearing uh, tinfoil hats. You know, they, these guys just get no traction. Uh, but but there is an awful lot of stuff going on that, that we just don't explain. And, well, that's, that was the old one. That was canceled a while back. And everybody thought it was over, but it turns out it wasn't over. They just changed the name and moved it to a different office. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh. All right. So uh, this. The data that we're touching on is based on our observations on a tiny fraction of our of our galaxy. Yeah. Maybe two one percent or two percent or not even. Not even. Not even one percent. So you've not even explored, not even observed one percent of our galaxy. And there are like hundreds of trillions of galaxies in the universe. There's billions. So to extrapolate, you know, that, that there's a special order in the entire universe when we only examine Less than one percent of all, our own little galaxy. Just a little so it's just you know, getting carried away, I think. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, there was an interesting article this week uh, talking about uh, that each black hole is possibly a white hole. Uh, a white hole is just another name for a big bang. 
So every black hole, and we've observed some, we know that uh, probably every galaxy has at least one black hole. Uh, yeah, we and know one. Right in the middle. Yeah, right in the middle. And if each one is a white hole, then like, the other side, so to say, there's this appearance of a cosmic horizon that they would call a Big Bang, too. Yeah. So maybe there's uh, as many Big Bangs as there are black holes, and as many as there are uh, galaxies, which is... And there are more galaxies than there are people I know. Yeah. <laughs> Still a lot to learn. Uh, well, one of the things that we, we learned from this presentation is that the so-called paradox isn't that much of a paradox. That you can, you can, you can accept relatively favorable factors for the Drake equation and say there's lots of civilization out here, out there, and yet the fact that we haven't seen anybody isn't a disproof of that. They can right. simultaneously. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's, I don't think the, the paradox is paradox at all. Yeah. Oh, just a couple more questions, and then we're going to uh, wrap it up so people yeah. can uh, have lunch. Have lunch. Get on with their day. Um, hey, Doris. Was it over your head? Yeah. So did I. <laughs> There's a uh, search for extraterrestrial intelligence that uh, is taking place now. That I was part of back in the Stone Age when Macintoshes were the size of a suitcase. Uh -huh. And they would send out um, software, uh, software uh, to your, to to your, your computer. Uh, SETI, right? SETI, right, S-E-T-I. And your computer, when it was not otherwise engaged, would analyze that and send reports back, I believe it's the Caltech, as to if there's any anomalies in there. And I think that's still going to this day. Yeah, I read about uh, it. And has magnified by many, many thousands of times because of the power of telescopes and so forth. So you could check it out online. It's free, and it, uh, it's kind of cool to be involved in. Looks like we're done. Okay. Very nice, Ron. All right. So, uh...